From the world of politics. No matter what your zip code is, your right to vote should be standardized. To the world of business. It's really kind of hard to find a commodity right now that's lower year over year. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. We start today with a very special guest. He is Mr. Tom Vilsack. He is the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. So welcome back, Mr. Secretary. Great to have you here. In Washington, one of the big subjects right now is infrastructure. What's going to get done in infrastructure? Give us the perspective from the Department of Agriculture and maybe more importantly from the perspective of the farmer. What is at stake in the infrastructure proposals? Critically important for uh, American agriculture and farmers, ranchers, and producers. Broadband to expand access uh, to real-time market information, improve transportation system that will allow us to be more competitive in a global market. Uh, an opportunity as well uh, to see our ports improved uh, so that we're able to ship uh, more product in and out of the U.S., which will obviously help exports. Uh, tremendous opportunity for us uh, on a variety of fronts. Climate smart agriculture investments uh, to allow farmers to, to lead this effort at reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and at the same time be more profitable. Uh, an opportunity as well for bio-based manufacturing to bring jobs back to rural, uh, uh, rural America, which is obviously very important to farm families that need that second farm, uh, second off-farm income to be able to keep the farm. So Secretary Bill second listening to you, I think what I heard was those advantages really would be embodied in what is being proposed is that bipartisan proposal, the somewhat more modest one, it's still over a trillion dollars, that seems to be moving forward rather than the second aspect of it. Uh, in the second oh. aspect, there's also what I think of as food stamps, I think you call the SNAP program. Talk about that. Yeah, the second aspect of it is, is the uh, opportunity as well to strengthen the American families, uh, a chance to provide and expand nutrition assistance to families that are struggling, so the children have access to quality and nutrition, not just during the school year, but also through the summer months, an opportunity to uh, expand uh, better quality uh, meals uh, at school uh, for free and reduced lunch kids by expanding the universe of those who qualify, uh, a chance as well to improve nutrition. Uh, all of those wrapped up into the family's uh, portion of, of the uh, reconciliation package. In addition, child credit, uh, child care and dependent uh, tax credit, incredibly important to helping struggling families. The ability to get uh, two years of pre-K education to get a good start uh, to school and the opportunity for free college tuition at community colleges or increased Pell Grants uh, if you're going to a four-year college program, making college more affordable and available. Uh, these are critically important to uh, strengthening the American economy. The stronger the American family is, the stronger the American economy will be. Uh, that reconciliation package, as you referred to it, is uh, not quite as far along, as I understand it, at least, in the specifics as the bipartisan version. But we are told that in that bi uh, that uh, reconciliation package, there will be proposals for pay-fors, as they say in Washington, coming for increased taxes. Identify one in particular that we're told might affect the family farm, and that is that step-up in basis on inheritance. Are you hearing resistance from farmers? You know this community so well. You come from it. Is there resistance on that that would really hurt us in our family farms because we do have a, a fair amount of accumulated wealth and inheritance of the farms. Well, there is concern until you explain to farmers that as long as the family continues to own the farm and continues to operate the farm, there's not going to be a taxable incident. If, in fact, the family decides to sell the farm after mom and dad pass away, at that point, there is a million dollar per person exemption, a uh, couple, two million. If there's a household, uh, a homestead on it, another half a million. That covers almost 99% of the family farming operations in the country today. When people hear that, they feel a little bit more comfortable about uh, the notion. People do understand that at the end of the day, strengthening the American family, strengthening the American economy, that those who have uh, benefited from the current economy very well, uh, they need to pay their fair share. And I think most people find not only the, the, the programs popular, but also the way in which the programs are gonna be paid for as popular as well. Bipartisan support across America for these programs. Secretary Vilsack, as you know, one of the subjects, certainly in financial markets, but more broadly, is the possibility of inflation, and particularly rising food prices. We had Unilever, for example, come out yesterday and say they think it's the worst they've seen in 10 years. What are you seeing in terms of food prices? Do we have an inflation challenge right now that we're facing? 
Well, I think there's also a challenge to sort of separate the food that uh, is purchased for the home versus the food that's purchased uh, uh, outside the home. Uh, we're seeing obviously increases in, in outside the home uh, food costs, uh, pretty significant. The overall food inflation rate is not that much uh, higher uh, th than it normally is. There are certain selected items uh, in the grocery store that folks may see at least for a period of time, increased costs. But we think this is gonna even out, if you will, as we sort of begin to recover as we begin to get uh, the supply and the demand in better, a better balance, I think you're going to continue. You will see a, a moderation uh, of the food inflation. One of the inputs into cost, obviously, is labor costs. Talk about what the family farmer or other farmers are facing right now in terms of labor. Is there a shortage of labor? Are they having to pay increased wages? Well, I think the, the family farmers are very interested in having Congress take action on a broken immigration system. Uh, there is a bipartisan bill that passed the House that's now in the Senate, has strong agricultural support from over 80 agriculture uh, groups, basically modernizing uh, the ag workforce, basically providing a, an opportunity for legitimacy of the current workforce of 2.4 million workers, about half of them probably undocumented uh, workers, uh, giving them an opportunity to come out of the shadows, uh, providing stability as well as a, a structure uh, that both labor and farm groups uh, are, are supportive of. Certainly would hope that the Senate would take that particular proposal very seriously and get it passed. Again, passed in a very strong bipartisan vote in the House. Secretary Vilsack, for those concerned about inflation in the country, one of the things they say is if we can adjust some of the trade, particularly reduce some tariff barriers, that might actually ameliorate some of the increased pressure on costs. Is that true in the agriculture secretary sector? Could you take us through what's going on with trade right now for you? Well, right now we're looking at a projected record uh, amount of ag exports uh, for 2021, uh, breaking the record that I think was set uh, about eight years ago uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, and I think that the, the big challenge, I think, from an ag export perspective, uh, tariffs obviously a, a, an issue, but a, a bigger issue, I think, is the need for diversification uh, of the customer base that we have. We're pretty dependent and pretty reliant on a handful of countries for ag exports, and I would like to see, hopefully over time, uh, the opportunity for us to expand in some additional markets, particularly in Southeast Asia. Secretary Vilsack, as you know well, President Biden now has an executive order on competition. And for a lot of us expecting that, we thought it would be a lot about big tech. And there is that in there. But also, your department features pretty prominently in the executive order. Could you give us a sense of what the most important aspects of that order are for the farmer, for agriculture, and particularly ones you can make some progress on in the short term? Well, I think President Biden understands that if you are going to get more new and better markets for farmers, uh, they have to be open and transparent. Uh, and the, the, the competition executive order directs the Department of Agriculture to take steps uh, to strengthen the regulatory uh, system uh, that oversees uh, our processing uh, industry, for example, uh, providing farmers perhaps better balance and more protections from the Packers and Stockyards Act. I think the president understands we need better price discovery. Uh, so that we really understand exactly what the market is and what it isn't, uh, whether people are being taken advantage of. Uh, I think he also understands and appreciates the need for more uh, competition and more processing capacity. We recently announced a $500 million effort to try to expand and leverage resources in the private sector and the nonprofit sector to expand uh, and to strengthen and make our system more resilient. He also wants us to take a look as well and the fact that we've got so few seed companies in the country today, uh, is there a way in which we can uh, enhance opportunities for input costs? Uh, and finally, uh, farmers buy a lot of very expensive machinery, uh, but it also appears to be very expensive to repair that machinery. And this uh, executive order is directing the opportunity for farmers uh, to essentially have the right to repair, which should bring down costs. Yeah, my understanding, you can correct me, is uh, that more is the FTC's responsibility than the right to repair. But specifically on the Packers and Stockyards Act, I'll be con honest with you, I didn't know about that act, I think, before I read this executive order. But that seems to be within your jurisdiction. How fast can you get that done? Is that a notice and comment? Does that take some months or even years? Uh, it, it will take some time, uh, but we've already worked on this during the Obama administration, uh, so it's not going to take as long as it would normally take. We have a very good idea about how to draw a bright line on, on discriminatory practices, a bright line on, on how we need to change the, the burden of proof, if you will, to prove a violation of Packers and Stockyards, and a bright line on, on trying to protect poultry growers, uh, particularly as they relate to a ranking system that the industry uses. 
Uh, so I, I think we're going to see a significant action on that in the very near term uh, to send a message to uh, producers across the country that we're looking for more open and transparent and fairer markets. Finally, Mr. Secretary, uh, you mentioned earlier the president's climate policies. Give us a sense of what, what that does to the farmer, because I can imagine some benefits, maybe with some of the, the carbon capture provisions that might make some money off of, but also it might increase costs. What does it mean for the average farmer? Well, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, uh, if we're truly serious about uh, reducing our emissions uh, countrywide uh, and economy-wide, I think agriculture has the opportunity to basically start that process, to lead that effort. I think we can get to a net zero emission future uh, perhaps quicker than some other aspects uh, of our economy. And for American farmers, I think the challenge is to create a, a number of opportunities, income opportunities out of the climate uh, challenge uh, to encourage embracing climate smart agricultural practices. This means increasing significantly the amount of money we put in traditional conservation programs and, and trying to meet the backlog that we already know exists in that space, but also creating new and innovative ways to, for farmers to take full advantage of the market opportunity that's created here. I think many, many uh, chains, many grocery stores are anxious to be able to market whatever they're selling in their grocery store as being sustainably produced. That's a value added proposition. We want to put farmers in a position to take full advantage of that value added proposition and in turn also be able to potentially qualify uh, for carbon credit markets that may be set up as well. So, Mr. Secretary, do the farmers understand what you just said? You said it's a great opportunity, the climate thing. Do they see it that way or does there need to be some persuasion there? Well, there's a growing understanding of this. Uh, I would say if you asked that question several years ago, I would uh, indicate that there was quite a bit of work to do uh, to begin the process of laying the ground for this. But uh, we're now seeing a number of uh, farm groups who are supporting the notion of moving forward on this. Uh, the American Farm Bureau, uh, National Farmers Union, and others have indicated and understand and appreciate the opportunity side and want to take full advantage of it. So I think we're seeing a growing understanding and appreciation for the opportunity side. We at USDA now have to create a mechanism uh, to, to seize on that momentum uh, to take the next step forward. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. That's Tom Vilsack. He's U.S. Agriculture Secretary. Coming up, Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana is here on infrastructure and the evolving fight against COVID. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. China has announced retaliatory sanctions against the United States over Washington's Hong Kong business warning. The U.S. State Department last week issued an advisory to businesses operating in Hong Kong, warning them of, quote, growing risks from Beijing's national security law. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs says there will be sanctions against seven individuals, including former U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. The Biden administration has announced more help to stem foreclosures in the wake of the pandemic. Enhanced assistance will be provided to homeowners with government-backed mortgages. The aim is to cut some monthly payments by roughly 25%. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. Infrastructure talks are coming down to the wire as a bipartisan group of senators are working to come up with the details that they need to move forward next week, they hope. We welcome now one of those doing the heavy lifting. He is Republican Senator B Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. So welcome, Senator. Great to have you back here. So we, he we heard we're going to have language on Monday. Then we heard maybe not. There's some problems maybe with transportation, probably with water. Where are we? Yeah, so we're working through today, through the weekend. We hope to have language either by Monday or by early next week. Yeah, there's some problems with transportation, with, with transit in particular. On the other hand, we can find a solution. We can get this done. So I'm optimistic that we will. And, and are, is the pay-for issue taken care of? I think I heard from Senator Manchin, perhaps, that he thought maybe you were pretty close to there. Yeah, we're pretty, pretty close to there. Folks will always find a problem with our pay-fors. They will always find a problem. On the other hand, um, um, we will have it paid for, and we will be able to not just pay for it, 
but point towards long-term gains the society will, the economy will benefit from, according to multiple economists across the political spectrum. So if you're able to have language by Monday or Tuesday of next week, something like that, having worked through the weekend, what does that mean in terms of the timetable down the road? Uh, are you going to get to your recess when you schedule in August? You're going to have to put that off. I don't know about the recess. Schumer controls the schedule, but he has indicated that we would have a vote as soon as possible. As far as I'm concerned, I think this package is so good for the American people. Uh, I'm willing to give up some of my recess if we can get this done. Uh, and because, again, it's great for the American people. So Schumer controls the calendar, but I'll be there whenever he calls it up. OK, so let me turn to COVID-19. As I said to you, you're a twofer because you're a medical doctor who's really practiced medicine as well. Let's talk about COVID-19, the Delta variant. Where are we with that right now? And let me ask you something. Uh, there was uh, you've always been, as I understand, it, in favor of vaccination. You've been very outspoken in that. Not everybody who, who has a Republican after their name has necessarily agreed with that. Is there a shift happening right now among the Republicans? Because it seems like more and more Republicans are coming your way on vaccination. Yeah, uh, more Republicans are coming my way on vaccination and part driven by tragedy. There are people who should not be dying who are dying from COVID infection. We had testimony from the CDC director. She said this is a, um, a, 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 an epidemic among the unvaccinated. So 99.5% of the deaths are among those who have not been vaccinated. And there's a lot of anecdotes to go with the statistic. A young nurse in Lafayette, Louisiana, recently died from a COVID infection. An ICU nurse, we can imagine that she got a big viral load from somebody coughing on her. But that said, that should not happen. One more thing to say, there's a young infectious disease doctor here in town. She put it very well. Either we accept the new normal is people dying who should not die, or we get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I think these facts and these anecdotes are driving home that all people, if they're if they're should be vaccinated, if they're nervous, talk to your doctor. And, and Senator, as I say, you've been very outspoken on this and very clear as a medical doctor. But there's been a lot of misinformation. I think it's fair to say about vaccination. We now have one of your colleagues, Democratic colleague Amy Klobuchar, who's proposing a bill that says let's cut back on some of that protection we give to social media under Section 230 uh, and, and when it comes to medical information. Does that make sense to you? I'd be very nervous of government beginning to censor social media. We have First Amendment protections for a reason. But what I can say is that uh, what I can say is that if somebody is nervous, they shouldn't be on Facebook. They shouldn't be talking to a, or listening to a politician. They should speak to their doctor. You got diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, all major risk factors for having a bad outcome if you get COVID. Speak to your physician. Ask her. Ask him. Should I take the vaccine, particularly given my health conditions? I know what the doctor is going to tell you. Then you, you know, you have a trusting relationship with them. I'm hoping that moves folks to get vaccinated. So let's talk about your physician in a sense, the chief uh, capital physician. There are reports now that he is considering reimposing some mask requirements up on Capitol Hill. As a physician, would you recommend that? You know, I, I don't know the science of that. I'm vaccinated. Clearly, the studies show that if you're vaccinated, it protects against the Delta variant. Uh, I may get infected. I'm not going to get hospitalized. I'm not going to die. Very low possibility of that. We have to reward people who've been vaccinated. If you say, oh, listen, you've been vaccinated, it doesn't matter. We're still going to make you wear a mask. That's a mixed message. Uh, it, uh, you know, I'll go where CDC recommends just because I'm supposed to. On the other hand, just looking at the science of it, if you're vaccinated, you should be protected. So looking at the science of it, tell us about the school year, because I think an awful lot of us are concerned with the school year, either because we have kids to go back to school, either at college or in public school, or because it really affects the economy so much about whether parents can have to, have to stay home because of it. What do you anticipate come September? Are we going to be OK? So there have been different rumblings about a mask mandate for children. First, CDC allows children 16 and above to be vaccinated. I'm, I'm, I'm told that within two months, the vaccine will be uh, proved as safe and effective for those younger than 16. Uh, so I vaccinate whoever is eligible for vaccination, just like we do for measles and hepatitis B, number one. Number two, we can say that children who do not have an underlying health condition are extremely low likely to have uh, a symptomatic infection. So the child would still be safe. If mom and dad are infected, 
even if the child happens to be exposed at school, mom and dad almost certainly are safe. So they, depending upon the prevalence of infection in the community, there may be a mask mandate. But I think if parents have been infected and if their child is younger, they can be comfortable that they are safe uh, and even if the child is not asked to wear a mask. Uh, finally, we have some of your fellow Republicans. For example, the governor of Florida, the governor of Arkansas, are really coming out now and campaigning in their states. Do we need to hear more from pre former President Trump on vaccination? David, I lost you. I didn't hear what you just said. Oh, I'm said. sorry. Do we need to hear more from former President Trump on vaccination? You know, I, I just think that President Trump got vaccinated, and he is very much proud of Operation Warp Speed, as he should be. Uh, I think now is the time for people to hear from their doctor. Hmm. Uh, again, you got diabetes, you're obese, um, et cetera. Speak to your physician. And she or he can give better advice than I think any political advice, than any political figure can give. Makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much. It's always a great pleasure to have you with us. That's Senator Bill Cassidy. He's a Republican of Louisiana. Coming up, Chinese online tutoring just got a whole lot less profitable, giving us our stock of the hour. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Chinese government reportedly is declaring all tutoring companies nonprofits, which doesn't help the tutoring company's stocks like New Oriental Education. It's our stock of the hour, and Dave Wilson is here with the story. So this sounds pretty ugly for these people. Well, it really does. And, you know, what we're talking about here are companies that run websites where students, you know, go through the mandatory Chinese curriculum at night, on weekends, even on holidays. New Oriental is the oldest in terms of a U.S. listing. It's been public here since 2006, but we've seen many more companies come into the market, including one just last month. So now you have people familiar with the matter telling us that the Chinese government is going to move against these companies. You mentioned the nonprofit element, uh, that they wouldn't be allowed to raise capital or go public anymore, and they wouldn't be allowed to have foreign investors. And that's where, you know, the American depository receipts of these companies come in. You know, it, it's part of a broader effort, clearly, uh, to address the whole issue of investment here in the U.S. into China. But we're really seeing these uh, ADRs take a beating. You, you look at declines of 60 percent or more in the shares, wow. and it's clear that the industry is shifting in a way that goes against U.S. investors. So it's not just Didi. Thank you so much to no, Dave Wilson, not. our stocks editor. Coming up, the Tokyo Olympics have begun, but they're like no others. We talk with Sheila Smith of the Council on Foreign Relations about how we got here. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Summer Olympic Games have begun in Tokyo a year late and surrounded by controversy in the midst of a COVID surge. Bloomberg's Juliet Sally takes us through what it took to get us here. A global sporting spectacle in the middle of the worst public health crisis in a century. The Games are going ahead, but they've already been described as the weirdest Olympics ever. Given fears, a global gathering of about 90,000 athletes, officials and volunteers could become a cauldron of COVID variants. Strict measures are in place aimed at stopping a potential super spreader event. Most of the athletes are vaccinated, but they'll still have to test daily and stay in a bubble within the Olympic Village. Socialized and group meals are banned. Win or lose, athletes must leave Japan within 48 hours after their last event. Japan wanted this Olympics to mark a turning point for humanity, a light at the end of the tunnel for a world stumbling through a second year of the pandemic. But those ambitions have crumbled. Tokyo is under a state of emergency through the entire Games. Thousands of athletes are set to compete in empty stadiums with no chance, no fans, no families to offer support. Prime Minister 
Yoshihide Suga's political fortunes are closely tied to a successful games, which were supposed to symbolise Japan's recovery from the 2011 earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster. But athletes and officials have had to brave a cascade of calamities just to get to the opening ceremony and an uncertain legacy awaits the entire Olympic movement at the finish line of Tokyo 2020 and could mean a very different looking games in Paris in 2024. That was Bloomberg's Juliet Sally. To take us through what these games could mean for Japan, we welcome now Sheila Smith, Council on Foreign Relations Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Studies. So welcome, Sheila. It's good to have you here. Uh, to put this in a broader perspective, it's not just the light at the end of the tunnel after pandemic. Put it back in the perspective of coming back after 1964, which is an enormously successful uh, reemergence of Japan in 1964. And then we had then Prime Minister Abe really go after these games. Now Prime Minister Abe can't even go. What does this mean for Tokyo and for Japan more broadly? Well, David, it's, it's just sad um, because there is so much ambition here set out at the bid when Tokyo bid for the Olympics. And also, as you pointed out, when Prime Minister Abe former Prime Minister Abe said that he would, you know, this would be Japan's rejuvenation, a chance to show the world that, that Japan is back from its disaster, but also back on the global stage. So this is much more scaled down. It is much more curtailed. And Prime Minister Suga, the current Prime Minister, is really struggling. His approval rating is very low, but to be very frank, the Japanese people are very nervous and they're very scared that their government is not going to be able to protect them from the super spreader event that might might emerge. Well, and as I understand it, the Japanese people are not 100% far from it behind these games being held right now. No, public opinion of polling has softened just a little bit, but about a month ago that you were seeing polls where about 83% of Japanese were saying no thank you to the games, either postpone them or cancel them altogether. There's a kind of acceptance now that they're going forward. And so you see on the street in interviews by the Japanese media, you know, individual Japanese will say, we, we want it to be a success. We want the athletes to compete. We love the Olympics. But just in this particular pandemic context, it's just very hard for the Japanese to participate. Now, money is only one aspect of this. There's a lot more involved in that. But this is Bloomberg, so let's talk about money for a second. <laughs> the estimates I saw were something over $12 billion in costs originally. As we know, a lot of cities don't do that well financially from these deals. Then, because of the delay, something over $15 billion. But I've also seen it reported that actually the number is much higher than that. Do we have any sense of what the numbers look like? Right. So even before we got to today, you had uh, the government's account is $12 billion, right? But the government uh, audit a year or so ago basically said that that's, that's half of what's probably going to cost Japan. So already you've got 20, 22 billion by, by government auditing, right? Now you've got, with all the, the coronavirus pandemic measures, all this, the spending that needed to take place to make the Olympic Village as safe and as contra control controlled as, as possible, now you've got added spending. There's also, David, as you know, the loss of income that often comes with Olympic Games. No tourists coming to Japan, no, no ticket sales, that's 800 million or so. Um, and of course, you've got the private companies who are the sponsors, Toyota and many others, who really put a lot of money, some say three to five billion dollars of their own money into making the Olympics a success. And they will get no rebound because there's no activities, no people there to see what they had to display and what they had to put forward as their new products. So I, I think all told, it's hard to put a number. We'll probably be able to do that a year from now, maybe. Um, but there's a significant loss of, of income for Japan. What about the political consequences? There's an election coming up in the fall. Uh, Prime Minister Suga's uh, approval rating is not all that high. Uh, what is this going to mean for his fate and the fate of his party, for that matter, the Liberal Democrats? Yeah, I think this is the big question for Japanese looking forward as we look over the horizon after the Olympics. Now, we're not over the horizon yet, so it depends on if we have this really bad event or if we manage to see the Olympics come off, at least without having any public health crisis. But I think Prime Minister Suga is down, his public approval is in the low 30s, and it hasn't come up at all. Many of his cabinet members are under siege. The vaccine rollout, which Japan was slow to begin, has suffered. Uh, there's only about 74 million doses are, are, have been distributed which is about 29% of the Japanese people. This is according to your Bloomberg team in Tokyo. Um, so this is not what the Japanese people expected of their government. And I suspect the voters, when they go to, their, go to the poll in October, uh, they're going to give the LDP a bit of a setback. 
Uh, Sheila, one of the things I found surprising in reading some of your writings on it is this has exposed some uh, weaknesses in the healthcare system in Japan. I just had assumed they had a wonderful healthcare system. It appears there may be some holes in that system. Well, they do have great health care in the sense that they've got a, you've got they've got universal health care, um, so everybody gets access to health care that's equitable access for everyone, urban or rural. So you've got a lot of small clinics that deal with local populations, whether you live in the city or you live in the countryside. What what's harder is a larger system of intensive care, emergency medicine, um, OBGYN access for women for. Um, giving birth is not uh, very prevalent in the cities anymore because people have moved to the suburbs. So you've got a system that under COVID became very, uh, very pressured. And you had a system that had a really hard time making sure that they could deal with the emergency cases that were coming up. Final point, and you know this well, but Japan is a, a regulatory state. Uh, and at some time, those regulations get in the way. And in this particular instant, that was a problem for the vaccines. The Japanese insisted on having their own clinical trials for Pfizer, Moderna, J and J, and they that substantially delayed their access to vaccines for their population. So this has revealed some of the the, the problems in crisis moments of crisis for the healthcare system, and I think you're going to see some remedies be discussed as we look forward. Shell, I take your point that it'll take some time to really sort out what the consequences are. But let's take us back to the original thinking to go after these Olympics to begin with. As you said, it was reemergence from some of the crises that Japan had been through. I understand they thought this would really help their economy because you'd get more tourism, you'd get more business for Japan. What is the over and under now, given where they were hoping to go and where they're ending up? What are the Japanese people thinking about their expectations? Well, you know, Japan's an aging society. Its demographics are putting a significant pressure on its economic productivity. The Japanese government has a very high debt uh, burden already. So there's also a fiscal challenge for the Japanese going forward. You've got this demographic pr pressure on the economy and the economic performance. And then you've got somewhere around what the current estimates are about 260% uh, of government debt. It is about 260% of their GDP. So a very high debt fiscal pressure. At the same time, you're going to look at the state trying to take on this burden of an aging population. I think what you see going forward is you've had growth under Abe. Uh, and that's in the last five, six years ago. He's kind of turned Japan around to a positive growth uh, country. But he, they suffer all of the problems of the advanced industrial economies. Their growth is slow. It's sputtering at times. And this pandemic, of course, has put real strain, not just the Olympics, but the um, pandemic in general has put real strain on Japanese productivity. So abroad, you see the supply chain challenges for Japan are acute. Uh, you see the access to energy and resources, again, acute. Um, and so I, I just think this is going to be a very difficult time for Japan to get itself back on its feet. I think you'll see positive growth, but you're certainly not going to see it at the, at the level that you've seen in the last five or six years. Sheila, really great to have you with us. As you said at the beginning, it sounds like a rather sad story right now, I'd have to say. Thanks very much to Sheila Smith of the Council on Foreign Relations. We turn now to Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, of course, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Pfizer and BioNTech have announced that the U.S. government has purchased an additional 200 million doses of their COVID-19 vaccine. The companies expect to deliver 10 million of the additional doses by the end of this year, with the rest to be delivered no later than April 30 of 2022. The government also has the option to acquire an updated version of the vaccine to address potential variants. And Israel's health ministry says its research shows that the Pfizer vaccine provided a strong shield against hospitalization and more severe disease in cases caused by the Delta variant. But it says the vaccine was only 39% effective in preventing infections. The data is likely to fuel debate over whether booster shots should be given to people who have already been vaccinated. The job market has sprung back to life in London. Two separate surveys show it's become a hotspot for the first time since the pandemic closed vast sections of the economy. The Recruitment and Employment Confederation says London had six of the top 10 areas in the UK for new job postings last year. And the job search website Indeed says consulting and financial firms were among the top companies seeking staff in the city. 
South Africa's COVID-19 vaccination campaign is regaining momentum after being disrupted earlier this month by a week of riots sparked by the imprisonment of former President Jacob Zuma. The country's acting health minister said today that at least 120 pharmacies, including 70 the 71 that were vaccination sites, were damaged and closed during the unrest. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Coming up, getting our arms around a possible global minimum corporate tax with Craig Hillier of EY. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. G20 finance ministers have agreed in principle to a new international system for taxing corporations. But now they have to work out the details before taking it to the G20 principles in the fall. To explain what is involved and what hurdles remain, we welcome now Craig Hilliers, EY America's leader of international tax and transaction tax services. So welcome, Mr. Hilliers. Great to have you here. First of all, take us through what, what the steps are between here and there, because I understand there's an agreement in principle, but there's a lot of details we worked out before they even know what they're voting on. Yeah, there's a huge amount that still needs to be done. So what we've had is both the support from the G7 as well as the G20, as well as the OECD's, OECD so-called inclusive framework, which includes up to 139 members of the OECD. A uh, vast majority of them, in fact, 132 of them have agreed to these so-called pillar one and pillar two proposals. And I'll just give you a little bit of um, background on both. Pillar one is proposing, in effect, new uh, means of taxing global income, uh, rules around the allocation of profit and where it can be taxed. And then pillar two is focused on a global minimum tax. So it's important to remember there's two pieces of yeah. this. This is an important distinction that I'm not sure I'd heard about pillar one, pillar two, but I mean, to put it in my lay language, it's sort of one of them decides who gets to tax you. The other one says, how much do they have to tax you? Yeah, that's a fairly good, fairly good base summary there. Uh, and so one of those uh, possible obstacles is you mentioned all the countries who have signed off on it. Ireland, I, I don't believe has, and they've got a dog in this hunt. Is there an issue on the European side of getting everybody? Do they need 100% of the countries? Can they get Ireland? There could be, yes. Ireland, as well as a, there's three other European countries that have also not signed on. So if you talk about the seven countries that are, have not signed on of the 139 or so, three of them are in Europe. Ireland has a 12.5% tax rate. It's been very important to the Irish government uh, on, a, on parties across the spectrum in Ireland is an important pillar of attracting business, making Ireland very competitive. A lot of US multinationals have significant operations in Ireland, and Ireland wants to continue to be a competitive, um, highly functioning economy that attracts business. So I think they are still debating their approach, um, considering um, how they want to approach the negotiations with the OECD. Remember, what was suggested was a minimum tax rate of at least 15%, and certain countries would like it to be higher. So I think Ireland's keeping their cards close to their vest. They want a stake in this. And you're right, usually in the EU on tax policy matters, you need unanimity between the members. So I think there'll be quite a few discussions for, with Ireland, with the OECD, and within the EU as well. So you have some European countries like Ireland. Uh, the United States, the government has said they're in favor of it in the form of the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. But we have a pesky thing called a Congress here. And as I understand it, if they all agreed to do this, you'd need legislation. You need to get it through Congress. Uh, we have some Republicans who are saying, as I understand it, no way, no how. Yeah, I think, um, remember, if you're talking about pillar two, or pillar one and pillar two, several of the pillar two proposals are in President Biden's Made in America tax plan. He's got some proposals in there that align the US to these global minimum tax rules. And Secretary Yellen has been quite vocal on the need to have the rest of the world have a global minimum tax. So I'm sure they're focused on having their policies aligned. The more controversial pil pillar is pillar one around the allocation of taxing rights globally. And you know, ranking member um, Mike Crapo in the Senate Finance, for example, 
um, put out a public statement, um, you know, really questioning, was this something that was going to disproportionately impact US com companies? And certainly, you know, all governments worry about tax sovereignty. And when you're talking about reallocating taxing rights, it obviously puts tax sovereignty uh, front and center. So the OECD can say what they like. All of these recommendations, once they come out and are agreed, need to be implemented into domestic law. And, you know, in a parliamentary system, um, that perhaps is easier than in a US system where we need to get this through um, the House and the Senate and have the administration supported as well. And we know that there's already questions about the Made in America tax plan um, on the uh, Republican side. It is likely we suspect that any, any tax changes, material tax changes will need to go through reconciliation. And I think when it comes to considering implementing rules for pillar one, which will likely require changes to tax treaties, that will be certainly a challenge um, with the makeup of the Senate at the moment. At the same time, Craig, it depends on what the alternative is, doesn't it? And when you talk about disproportionate effect on U.S. companies, as I recall, one of the triggering events of this was some countries like France, for example, saying we want a digital tax. And that was going to be really targeted at big U.S. companies. That's right. And that's why the administration is, has said that they are supportive of both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. They've put forward their own proposals on Pillar 1. They slimmed it down a little bit from what the original OECD proposal was. And they realized that the rest of the world is probably going to want to see the US engage in the debate on Pillar 1 if they're going to agree to pull back on their digital services taxes, which many have identified do disproportionately impact uh, US companies. And finally, Craig, if I can, let me get personal a little bit here. You must advise a lot of these big corporations. How much time and effort is being spent right now in trying to lobby, not a bad term, lobby what goes into the details that get put before the G20 come fall? I think uh, certainly U.S. companies and global companies have been very involved. This is the second round of so-called OECD BEPS proposals. I actually think they're more engaged in this round on pillar one and pillar two than they were on the proposals in 2015. I think they know they need to have their voice heard. These are complex matters. There are many things that need to be considered. And I think everyone wants a tax system that's transparent and you know, works for all and is easy to administer both for governments and for corporations. So the, the clients I'm talking to are actively engaging directly or through trade associations, both in the US and with the multinational bodies. Okay, Craig, really great to have you with us. That was very clear for a tax explanation, which usually I have difficulty with. That's Craig Hillier. He's EY America's an international tax and transaction tax services leader. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We're going to end today with something we haven't done yet, which is look at the markets overall. And Kriti Gupta is here to take us through it. So let's start with equities. We started out the week, by the way. Equities were really having a tough time, but they've come back. They totally have. But, you know, if you uh, look at, for example, a five-day time span, then you do start to see it is a round-trip journey. I mean, <laughs> equities are right back to where they were literally a week ago. So it doesn't really say that we've made a ton of progress, but we very clearly bought the dip. And, I mean, look at what's leading the charge. It's tech all the way. And so what drove it down? What drove it up? Is there any reason for this, Critty? Well, it, okay, so the re downside reason is definitely going to be the Delta variant. Yeah. And I know everyone always says it's always this major risk factor, but this time it actually was. And you could see it in the COVID cases over the weekend. So immediately on Monday, it did spook investors. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that risk is gone. It just means that there's so much dip buying, so much cash on the sidelines that people are buying in. But also remember, they're drifting higher because we have extremely low volume. I mean, down almost 15% on the S&P 500. And so some earnings that have not disappointed. And some, some earnings. some good earnings, right? I believe it's an 80% beat rate, wow. which is something that we <laughs> haven't seen yet, which is kind of crazy. Um, and we're going into tech earnings next week and the FOMC data. So a heavy week ahead, a lot of risk off positioning. Okay. And now the 10-year. I mean, we were on a march, a steady march to two and above. Where are we? 
Um, not there. <laughs> we are not there. I mean, listen, we dropped all the way down to 112 basis points. Who thought that was even possible? And right back, we're seeing yields come right back higher. I think we're hovering around 128 basis points right now. But I mean, the question is, do you continue to see them march higher when you don't have that reopening theme to back it up? Okay, Kriti, thank you so much for being here. That's Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk to AFL-CIA President Richard Trumka, who spent some time with President Biden yesterday on infrastructure. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.